Hello, this is Paul Check. Welcome back to my video blog. Today we begin a seven-part video series titled Movement as Medicine. Our first topic will be breathing. And then as we go through the series, my second part will be mobilization, third stretching, fourth stabilization, fifth exercise focusing on working in, sixth more about working out, and seventh and final I will share my five program design factors so that those of you who are motivated to do it right can design exercise programs that are fun, efficient, and effective. A reminder that much of what I'll be sharing in this series comes from my book How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. There's also a very nice little section on breathing, the mechanics of breathing, and zone exercises and how to use things like sound and other tools to enhance your zone or work in exercise practices. And that is the last four doctors you'll ever need how to get healthy now ebook available through checkinstitute.com as is the book. So with that in mind, let's see what I can share with you about breathing today. First of all, here you can see I've drawn two mock-up spines. Notice that this one here is longer than that one. Notice the air going into the nose. So inhalation is an act where the diaphragm contracts and because the tendons of the diaphragm, which are called cura, attach to the front of the lumbar spine at L2 and L3, which is really right behind your belly button, when the diaphragm contracts, it creates a lifting force on the anterior, the front of the lumbar spine, which reduces the lumbar curve. And then when the spinal extensors contract to lengthen the spine to open the rib cage to draw in, the two of those, in general, cause a lengthening of the spine. So if you just put your hand on top of your head or lean up against a wall and take a deep belly breath, Typically, you'll see the spine will lengthen somewhere between, oh, half a centimeter and a centimeter, depending on how healthy your spine is. So inhalation causes a reduction in spinal curvatures. When you exhale, the diaphragm relaxes and rises up. You don't have tension in the cura or the tendons of the diaphragm, and the spinal curves increase. So here you notice that the spine's getting shorter. So one of your first tips about breathing is that A, the average person takes 25,900 breaths a day. Now, interestingly enough, Rudolf Steiner showed that our breathing rate, 25,900 a day, is an expression of how long it takes us to move through the 12 constellations of the zodiac or uh, I believe what the Mayans would call the long count. So there is a correlation in, in our bodies to the universe, and Steiner made many, many neat explanations of that. That's important to understand because breathing, you breathing, is an act of the universe. Everything that's alive is breathing, and the two basic qualities of the universe are that it's everything yet paradoxically, as Stephen Hawking and others have showed, no thing. So the no thing is the emptiness that relates to inhalation, and the everything is the exhalation. Everything is being expressed in the universe. So your breathing is a quality of the universe itself, as are you. And the inhalation process of lengthening the spine causes compression on the vertebral discs, which squeezes fluids out of them because discs do not have direct blood supply. So when we inhale and lengthen and exhale and shorten, our spine goes through a constant rhythmic pumping called imbibition. And that imbibition causes fluids to flow in and out, keeping the connective tissues, the bones, the discs of the spine nice and healthy. And each one of the vertebra is like a little mini energy generator. So just like you have seven major chakras on the body, you have 120 minor chakras 
centered in each joint. So when our spine's moving properly in the influence of breathing, we're not only generating energy from breathing, but the mechanical action of stretching connective tissues, pressures, fluids flowing, creates hydroelectric activity, stretching connective tissue creates piezoelectric activity. So without going into a long detailed explanation, because I could, and it would take a long time, just know that breathing properly is regulating the flow of energy and the flow of fluids throughout the body. It is through the act of breathing that the heart is supported to bring oxygen and nutrition to each region of the body and to remove waste. So next you see that as you inhale and the diaphragm drops down, it pushes down on your organs. Your pelvic floor down here has to stay sealed or every time you inhale, everything would fall out the bottom of you. So when you inhale and your belly expands, when you take a breath, the first two thirds of the breath should come first through the nose, ideally. And you should let that belly expand and the first two thirds should happen without chest movement and only in the last third should you get chest movement. While that's happening, when you're inhaling, you're lengthening this way, you're widening that way, and you're also getting bigger front to back. One of the most common areas people stop moving is right down here in the region of the kidneys where the ribs should open. So as you're breathing, you should see widening of the ribs. I can't get my hand back there. The ribs should lift up. And that means that those kidneys are getting pumped as well. So not only is this essential to move fluids through the body, but every time your diaphragm comes down, it gives each organ a little squeeze, which pushes venous blood back toward the heart and aids significantly in the flow of lymphatic fluids, which helps your immune system and keeps your body clean. So every time we breathe, these organs are getting a pumping massage to help move fluids out, and that maintains what's called motility. Each of the organs has a natural rocking movement that's essential for its function. So remember, breathing in through the nose is important to do as often as possible because you have parasympathetic nerve endings in the nose so when you're breathing in through the nose, you're actually exciting and fortifying your digest, eliminate growth and repair branch of the autonomic nervous system. If you start breathing through the mouth, typically what's going to happen is that sends a signal to the brain that you're under stress because it's not normal to breathe through the mouth unless you're running for your life or fighting for your life or doing heavy work, which triggers the sympathetic nervous system, which comes typically with the release of stress hormones such as cortisol uh, and adrenaline and the, or the glucocorticoid family. So keeping the air coming in through the nose, getting full expansion, letting the diaphragm drop down, and the biggest thing particularly for the women is to let your belly expand because all that holding in causes tremendous disruption in the flow of fluids and the motility or pumping of organs and leads to a lot of emotional blockage and mental emotional patterns. And whenever you have a disruption in the breathing system, you have a reduction in the inflow of oxygen. Oxygen is the most primary nutrient for our survival. You have about three minutes before your brain starts to die without it. So it's more important than water. It's more important than food. It's more important than working out. So getting your breathing right is the basis of movement as medicine. So with all these things said, we now have a basic understanding of the mechanics of breathing and why we need to have a belly that expands and organs that get pumped and spines that get joints mobilized. We know that you have to breathe in three planes and you should start with your belly and you should breathe through your nose. Now, when we look at how the spine or the human body is constructed energetically, which I show in How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy on page 100 and 101, I show these physical correlations, and on page 101 I show the psychological correlations so that you can track where you're having challenges in your body. And on page 121 there's a chart called the piano spine that shows which glands and organs connect to which spinal centers so that you can understand if you're having pain in muscles or joints, what organs might be connected, or if you're having gland and organ challenges, what muscles and joints 
might be contributing to the dysfunction if they're not working correctly. So now when we look at these energy centers, these are basically indicators of how the psyche or the soul or the part of you that's invisible but there, right? There's more to you than just your body. So the way the psyche manifests itself and invests itself in the body can be seen by taking these mental emotional themes or drivers, if you will, attractors, we're all attracted to safety to some degree. We need to have a certain degree of safety in order to be a normal uh, human being that can relax and produce and, and create. So what I'm pointing out to you here is as I go through these centers, I want you to realize that if you're not breathing effectively, you may have a disruption to flow into the glands, organs, and tissues that, that are on each of these channels. And if you're breathing too much, too fast, such as a fear pattern or hyperventilation pattern, you're likely to outgas too much carbon dioxide and have too much oxygen, which excites the sympathetic nervous system and triggers a fight or flight reaction. If you don't, if you don't breathe at a normal rhythm and you outgas too much carbon dioxide, the parasympathetic system gets shut down. If you breathe too slow and hold your breath, you starve for oxygen. That triggers a fear reaction as well. So having healthy, normal breathing is very important. And most of the things that stop us from breathing are built or connected to our thoughts and our emotions and our beliefs. So this shows you the psychological associations that I look for whenever someone has a problem. If they've got a problem in the lumbar spine or legs or bones, I look to see about issues of am I safe in their life. So we have to remember that breathing is the beginning of a process that brings air into the lungs, but once the air gets into the bloodstream, the concept of breathing now switches to the concept of respiration, which means exchange of gases or oxygen from cell to cell through the systems at a micro level, at an individual level. So somebody, for example, with chronic tension in their groin is potentially not getting enough oxygen into those tissues, which could lead to a prolonging of the injury and the inflammation. So I need to know, well, what is the theme that would cause a person to hold emotion in that part of their body? And what you find is oftentimes orthopedic approaches don't work because you keep doing the right therapies and the right massages and the right stretches, but the problem won't go away. Well, usually that's because you're having an emotional guarding pattern. So if you're angry and you need to hold it in, or you're depressed, or whatever you would consider a blocked emotion that gets trapped in your body will excite the muscles in that area and lead to a bracing pattern, which can cause all sorts of problems in the long run. So the themes that we're looking for here, whenever we look at the different parts of the body that can have problems, and that relates to all things connected to these spinal regions and nerves, is am I safe? Am I creating what I want? That's the second chakra. The second chakra is the home of your creative sex energy, your core life force energy to create yourself with every day, to do your work, play, art, dance. All of that comes from here. Am I contributing to the world? Am I actually participating? And am I contributing to my dream of my own self-evolution? Am I giving and receiving love effectively? Am I communicating and bringing my creative impulses into creative expression? So the art impulse or the impulse to make love manifests through contact and expression with a huge emphasis on our hands. If you want to find out how important the fifth chakra is to the second, then just try tying your hands behind your back and making love to someone and you'll see that it'll drive you crazy because you cannot express what's coming from your root energies through your hands. So if someone has creative impulse that they cannot express, it can bottle them up tremendously and interestingly enough, the lack of expression of creative sex energy can create a tremendous problem in the neck, especially if someone's in an intimate relationship and they're not able to express their wants, feelings, and needs around 
their creative sex energy or the way they're expressing themselves, it causes a tremendous bottling up in the neck, which disrupts breathing because these muscles here are called the scalene muscles and they're very involved in breathing. So once emotions from not creating effectively get trapped in the neck, it disrupts the breathing process very commonly. Next, we go up to the sixth zone or chakra, which is the home of imagination and open-mindedness. What a concept. So people that are having problems here often have challenges with their brain and their nervous system. So a common example of a sixth chakra challenge is headaches. The seventh chakra deals with who am I beyond my persona? Who am I without my body? Who am I when I'm in deep sleep at night and don't even know that I'm here? And more importantly, what's next? So this is the home of the gate through which the soul will leave at the time of death. And that's why there's a little door there. So Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung refer to this as the home of your myth. What is going to be your reality when you leave this reality? And if that reality is not well established in you, it creates a primal fear because the fear of death manifest down here in am i safe so when we have challenging religious ideas and we believe in hell and all that not so fun stuff it is almost a guarantee that you're going to have a lot of blockage in your body and i believe that's great spirit's way of showing you that your ideas are really not very true when ideas are true there's a sense of harmony and balance in us so these are all psychological indicators of types of thoughts and feelings that lead to blockage in the body and disrupt both breathing and respiration. So you have a reduction in blood flow to these areas if you have issues around that. And not only does it cause a reduction in the flow to the muscles and the joints and the tissues because of the emotional holding, but it disrupts the overall breathing pattern. So the pain teacher will emerge and the pain teacher is my uh, concept for awareness created by pain, using pain as a tool for healing as opposed to medicating it and burying it, which does nothing. So when we look at the pain teacher, if we have increased tension in our bodies, which is a common reaction to these things, we have decreased breathing capacity, which means decreased respiration, which means stasis in fluids and tissues. And in nature where fluids don't move, all sorts of little parasites and creatures and decomposers show up to rot things. So when you look, for example, at a common form of stasis, constipation, we have massive problems with constipation in the world right now. And there's an old metaphysical saying, as above, so below. So what you see is, your beliefs and the way you live affects everything below your body. If you have too little tension in your body, so areas over here get flaccid and loose and aren't well put together, I'm sure you've seen people with bottoms that look like pudding or bellies that are that's a lack of tension. So where you have lack of tension, you have decreased pumping, which leads to stasis and is commonly connected to apathy, which means I don't care. So if a person just says, oh, screw it, I don't have time to exercise, and I don't even have time to look good anymore, blah, blah, blah. Well, that leads to stasis, not caring, and that is probably one of the most dark places to get because you are now disconnected from reality in a very, very big way. So in summary then, breathe through your nose, let your spine lengthen. Fill your belly for the first two thirds, your chest for the last one third. And you should be getting taller. You should be getting wider front to back and you should see these ribs opening up and feel them opening up. Remember to breathe is to pump and to pump is to clean and to oxygenate and nourish so that you grow and reproduce yourself accurately and efficiently each day so you can live your dream. There are body-mind themes that have been well, well, well researched. This is no longer airy-fairy, and it never was. So those of you that thought it was airy-fairy and talked down to people like me teaching this stuff can now look at hard science and realize 
that you might not have been very open-minded. Okay, so those are the key things I wanted to share today. Don't forget, there's piles of useful information for you in my little book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. 25,900 times a day. Do it right, you feel great, you think great, you look better, you smile more often, your sex life is better, your creative expression is better. Do it wrong and you're singing a different song and be careful because it may not last too long. Hope you enjoyed my little lecture on breathing today. I will look forward to sharing more with you in our next section, which will be on mobilization. See you soon.